the Game of Life study last week, so I, but, but it is a, uh, a good example of a self-contained problem that we can talk about in a concrete way and then discuss how this application, this specific application, could manage its I.O. problem and think about I.O. IO issues. A lot of these lessons are going to be applicable to not just little automatons, but to these patterns show up in all kinds of applications. Just in case you forgot, I'm sure you didn't, it was just last week. Uh, game of life, you start off with an array, and then if a cell is, uh, is lonely, it dies. If it's crowded, it dies. But if it has uh, the right number of friends and support, it can create more of them. And, and so these things grow and shrink, and uh, you can create all kinds of fun patterns. Uh, we've got some code you can check out and follow along on your laptop. The decomposition problem, it, it's still, it, it's slightly different for, for I.O., but uh, not so different from the communication idea. You're going to have a, a natural data structure inside the uh, application. The application is going to think logically in, in this 2D array. So in this case, it's a 2D life problem. So you're going to there'll be a logical thinking about 2D. You're going to have uh, you're going to try to decompose. In this case, we'll decompose on a row basis. That makes sense. That's easy. Each point has to know its neighbors to the up, down, left, right, and diagonal, the eight, the eight neighbors on the on a 2D grid. And then uh, tricking, making things a little more complicated are these ghost regions, which make the communication more efficient, but complicate the storage system. We don't need to checkpoint or save or visualize or do anything with these ghost regions. They are merely there so that when we want to know our, our top neighbors, we don't have to go talk to a process. We can just consult a, a local cache. Now again, this is a pattern that we'll see repeated in several uh, domains, uh, trading off memory for less communication. And as, as Phil mentioned, checkpointing is something the applications do. They, they run for a bit, and then they snapshot their state. They do this for a bunch of different reasons. One, hardware does fail, although uh, the failure rates today are not as scary as we thought they were going to be five years ago, but they're still still there. Um, but you can also use these checkpoints as a step in, a product of your workflow. Uh, in the old days, the system, operating system did more to help you do checkpointing. Uh, I, an old timer I used to work with talked about the craze where uh, you didn't even have to ask the checkpoint; the operating system just snapshotted things, and that was how the scheduler worked. It would just fill the machine up with machine with nodes, and then when a high-priority job came through, it would snapshot everything, put them in the icebox, start up the new job, and then when that job finished, the old jobs would restore from the, the system-level checkpoint. Well, it, well, life is in some ways uh, simpler then, but also more complicated. Simpler for the operating system, harder for the, applica for the application writer. Uh, but as the application writer, you can control what you checkpoint. Just this information, this, this piece of data is all I need. I don't need my entire state, my entire cache, my open file descriptors. I'm just going to save this multidimensional array. Now, you could just dump, you know, take the, the raw memory mapping you've got in, in your process, dump it out to the file. That's fine. That works for many cases. But we can think of what we call a canonical representation. And that has a couple of advantages. One, uh, if you have a different number of processes restarting the application, no problem. You're looking at this uh, logical n-dimensional array, so I'll just redo my decomposition and, and pick up where I left off. I might hand off this canonical representation to my, uh, my visualization friend or my analysis friend. And now you've got a, a common uh, lingua franca between the two uh, pieces, as long as everyone understands what's going to happen. If you just dump the raw data from memory, then maybe that's not going to be uh, as possible. Again, this is sort of the discussion we were having earlier this morning about log structured per file workloads versus single canonical file. We'll talk about checkpoints, but the same questions you would ask, of, you, these are the same questions you would ask for any sort of I.O. artifact. What do, you, what do you need here? Well, you need to be able to uh, restore state. So you have to ask yourself, what are the important things here? Uh, we don't need to just go from the lowest level of address to the highest level of address and dump it all to data. Instead, we need to know things like, in this specific example, uh, let's put a small header there that talks about the, uh, the, the matrix that we're working with. It's going to be 500 by 500, say. And uh, maybe we want to save the working environment we were, we were in so that we can 
tell our future self or our, our collaborator something about this process, what we're doing here. And again, uh, this issue of what is a container, well, often a, a file on the file system is a convenient container. You could imagine in a, um, a future storage system, maybe those are, are data objects or something else a little more elaborate. But again, uh, it would be harder to deal with uh, one file per process in this game of life example than it would be if you just had a, a single uh, resource to, to consult for your checkpoint. And again, uh, we touched, I mentioned this briefly earlier, uh, if we get to the point in this application where everyone's ready to save their state, we've, we've done 10 iterations or whatever, uh, they can hit the, the, uh, the checkpoint at the same time, that, that lends itself to collectives. And as you heard last week in the MPI tutorial, um, collectives are really powerful. You get everybody working together, you take advantage of topology and optimizations, and uh, they're just a, a whole world of, of benefits, both in the I.O. space and in, in message passing, point-to-point um, -point messaging, that uh, just isn't quite there if you only have one process doing uh, I.O. or sending a message to, to one other process or, or file system. And we could certainly just skip all this, uh, this abstraction layer and, and code right up to an MPIO layer, but that will be a little bit limiting. Uh, we, we see this, again, in many cases, uh, you'll write a an application would write a, an I.O. interface that they then could swap different uh, backends for. The climate people have something called PIO. PIO could write raw MPIO, it can write parallel net CDF. When the Unidata and NetCDF people said, hey, we have parallel interfaces too, they could then uh, write a Unidata NetCDF uh, backend. And they didn't have to tear up the whole code, they had, they had this one set of functions to implement and, and, and that was it. So in this case, Similar story, and this, I think in, in abstract sense, is almost every I.O. API, initialize and finalize um, a routine to actually do the checkpoint. In this case, because we've got some, some uh, demonstration backends, there's a, you know, there's a question about, is, this, is the backend I'm configured for, can I restart for this, or is this only for, for demonstrations? And then the actual restart command. Uh, and you know, if that's all you need to do, you don't need to do any querying or any studying of the file, then you know, these, these five routines are, are a good starting point. And in this case, because of the nature of the, the game of life iterations and how things work in lockstep, they lend themselves naturally to be a collective routine. Um, and perhaps we could uh, document these, that, that collective nature in the, in the function call itself, but uh, we can also just say everything in the mlife IO namespace is collective. So to capture the state, right, we've got a, a, a file name, a, a bunch of data, and then some description of that data, right? This is, this is C, so uh, we have a fairly limited amount of, of, of data types at our disposal. We could go create a matrix data type, I suppose. But in this case, we're gonna pass in a set of pointers, that's the matrix, and then describe those pointers with rows and columns, and then something about how many iterations have we gone through uh, in, this, in, this, in this simulation. Uh, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about MPI info objects, but that's um, worth a little diversion here. The MPI info object is how the, the, the MPI IO library tunes itself. These are um, strings of keys and values. The fun part about them is that you can set whatever you want in them and the implementation, uh, if it doesn't know about it, can just ignore them altogether. So if you set a bunch of luster specific information in your MPI info object and then run over on GPFS, the GPFS backend may they just silently ignore those, those hints. Uh, these info objects are also uh, a fun source of optimizations. Uh, there's a couple uh, SCs back. You know, uh, there's some auto-tuning studies showed the benefits of these info parameters, which most people leave by themselves, or leave them alone, and uh, but if you, if you tweak them out, you can get a factor of seven performance, which maybe says more about the defaults on that system than anything in particular. But uh, the point is, this is this this, this key value structure is, is where we pass in a lot of tuning parameters. We won't see too much of that in these talks, but if you, if you remember that table I showed when I was last standing up here, uh, we turned on and off data saving, turned on and off collective I.O. with this info object. So if you were, if you were very industrious and you just downloaded the code and, and compiled it, and you ran the standard out version, you'd see after nine iterations uh, this depiction of the game of life state. 
and we'll walk through, we'll, we'll walk through the code of, of how you would do, do this. Because we're dealing with standard out, uh, it's a little different in MPI land. There's nothing guaranteeing that every process can uh, dump to standard out. There's certainly no reason to expect that the thousandth process can do it. Now, in practice, the, the implementation implementation and many others handles that OK, but again, we're trying to display something human readable, so we might just funnel things back to rank zero. Now, again, we just got done saying early, early first half of the session, Falling back to rank zero is bad news for performance. I know, but in this case, it's a good example. But, but it's also not so contrived because we've seen a lot of applications do this. It's a, it's a natural first step on the path towards getting parallel. You, you parallelize your computation, and you, you save the parallel I.O. part for later because it's a problem for later. You just send all your I.O. back to uh, a rank zero, and, and they do it. And, and so in climate, for example, when I first started at Argonne way back when, that was their their transition. They had just gotten used to, uh, they're transitioning from th these big crays where I.O. from rank zero didn't make much, didn't matter so much. Adapting to a, to a cluster environment where you need to have everyone do I.O. was, a, was a, a, a bit of adjustment for them. It took a few years to get uh, the right decompositions and get used to using Parallel CDF and other tools. So maybe you yourself have a, an application that is doing it all to I.O. from rank zero. It's, again, it's a good starting point. Save the, uh, the hard problems for when you actually, your benchmarking says, you need to actually worry about parallel I.O. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how, so I, okay, I'm gonna show the code. Uh, I, I bet not a few of you here are, would rather see like a Python example or maybe a Fortran example. We're gonna stick with C for now. It's what I know best and uh, we won't have to worry too much about the syntax of this, right? Because it's all on the screen. Uh, if you don't like C, sort of squint your eyes and look back at the higher level concepts that this is trying to, to demonstrate. I mean, because in the end, the idea of collective calls to an API, that's universal across Python, Fortran, whatever. The idea of um, describing the global state at the interface layer and implementing the details in the back end, that's again, doesn't matter about the language. And then the other thing that all of these different back ends are going to demonstrate is that no matter how many processes you have running, two processes on your laptop or a thousand processes on your, your supercomputer, uh, the, uh, you're still going to output one sort of ASCII snapshot to standard output. Okay, so this is going to be a little hard to read, huh? All right, but that's okay because the important things are highlighted in blue, which is, you can see that pretty well. Great. And who reads comments anyway, right? So uh, that's right. Where are we going to start with this? So I'll start from the beginning, right? This is just the beginning. There's a, it says page one of eight, but I'm going to hide a lot of the details. And you can look at the code on your laptop if you'd like to see all of the line by line uh, explanation. But we're going to start off with some utility functions. We talk a lot about uh, MPI data types and, and, and passing those down to the library. If you provide a description of your scientific data to an I.O. library, however means that, that is, you, just, you tell the I.O. library what your memory structure is like. Then that lets the I.O. library do a lot more in a single call. You, um, if you think about a, a simple POSIX I.O. operations, Open, write, read, close. There are a few non, you know, like read v and, and, and LIO, list IO, but they have their own restrictions. They're not uh, as flexible as a true like list, list IO interface. But the basic POSIX interface is a simple, take this region of memory and write it to this region in a file. And there's not a lot of context there. Scientific applications are much more rich in their descriptions of, of the structure, of the, 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 maybe even a multidimensional array has more context than just take this one set of bytes and write it out to, to this file. And so we use MPI data types to help describe that and then let the library do the appropriate optimizations. And of course, we're not going to actually call print commands or display commands from, from the code. We'll wrap that up with a function, uh, the row print, and will abstract the uh, operating system's way of doing sleeping. Some, type, some systems have U-sleep, some have nano-sleep, or some people have, some systems just have, old, really old, just have simple sleep. Uh, everything's gonna be based on a communicator. We'll see how that's important in libraries in the next few slides. Because if you're writing an I.O. library, the first thing you need to do is be a good library citizen and dupe the communicator. That keeps a, that gives your library a separate context uh, from the application. Sad story, uh, not, not crying sad, but embarrassing sad story, I should say. Uh, Parallel CDF, you know, a library I, I worked on with, with Northwestern, we had it deployed for 
an embarrassing number of years. And then one of our summer students comes in and says, when I do an all gather in my application, things get weird. I don't understand. This weird bug comes and goes. And so, well, OK. I don't know if people did that before, but let's look a bit. Turns out Parallel Net CDF was not duping the communicator. I sit here and I talk about being a good library citizen, and, and we weren't doing that. And the problem is that when Parallel Net CDF or your I.O. library does a collective routine or sends messages, uh, you want to have a separate context. You don't want the application's uh, imbalance of communicators or, or message coordination or whatever's going on in the application side to interfere with what you're doing. Likewise, what you're doing inside the library can't propagate up to the application if you work with a separate communicator. So once we dupe the communicator, the applications all gathered, had its own space, worked just fine. The broadcasts and whatever was going on inside Parallel CDF, that didn't interfere with anybody and, and everything was much better. Likewise, on Finalize, you'll clean up that communicator. And there's not much else here in init and finalize, but you can imagine this would be a good spot to register certain function callbacks or whatever else is going on. Finally, get to the actual part of the routine where we're going to do something. We're going to take that file name and this matrix description, and we're going to actually dump it out to the file. So again, we have this, these, these routines. I won't go into them too much, but there's some arithmetic going on in the background that turns your, uh, your rank in the global space into an actual location in this global logical 2D array. And you end up, if you have my rows and my offsets, you have your own sort of description of where you need to work on. Uh, you know, I guess, uh, I'm not a chapel programmer, but you know, by comparison, uh, if you were to see this in, in chapel, you just get your global array, and, and some of those elements would be nearby and fast, and some would be far away and expensive. But uh, a lot of those details would be hidden in, in PGAS languages. That's good for productivity and less good for tuning, but then again, you add those with you add different directives and you get that tuning back. So um, anyway, the point is everything's much more explicit in, in MPI and everything's much more explicit in MPI IO, which is part of why we have the other libraries to help hide those details. So here we finally start using some, some MPI data types. Right? Uh, everybody who's not rank zero is going to be sending sending data, and rank zero is the one who's going to uh, actually do the uh, display. Sorry, the next page is when they receive the data. Rank zero will display, print his row and then display what was just sent out. And so we can, again, we could certainly call out all the, the data type construction code, but it certainly, it's helpful you, know, you get back a, a type descriptor. It's certainly perfectly, it's perfectly acceptable and not bad engineering to stuff all that inside a uh, a function, and then just then you can reuse that. So you'll you'll know now the type description of your, of your location in memory, where you're going to uh, send that to rank zero. And MPI bottom is what you use when you're using absolute memory addresses uh, versus uh, would be a good example here. Um, I don't know. I end up using MPI bottom all the time, so I don't I'm having a hard time thinking off the top of my head about a not a counterexample. But Again, we're using the same communicator that we duplicated. Nothing's going to get in the way here. This is just fine. So after, we print, after rank zero prints its own rows, we do some receiving and, and display the, the row from everybody else. We go through, we iterate through everybody and print that. And that's how you get your, your 25 or however many rows you've got here. And then the little sleep here helps us uh, humans look at what's going on. And you can see the little life things fly through the screen and, and, and do everything. Um, so that's, oh, I guess I should be going back and forth between high, higher level and code level. But when we talk about describing the data, we saw that, that function call to describe the important uh, subset of data. Right? What we have here is, is a row of data, and then a small, you know, some small boundary condition that we don't want to worry about, and then another row, another row. That is uh, a natural fit for the MPI type create vector, or the vector type. We just make sure we start. Uh, after the ghost cells and, and stop before the other. Uh, we, make sure we, don't, we, don't, we make sure we don't include the ghost cells, and we don't want to include the, uh, the other edge boundaries. Those are treated differently. So we do two things. We, do a, we, we, we set up the stride here with the vector. So there's going to be you know, this many rows worth of vector. There's a, um, this plus two is to skip the boundaries. Then after we have this vector type, we put it in the right place in memory with a pretty small uh, H, in, H index type. H index is uh, the H part means we're dealing with actual hardware addresses. And uh, we get the, we get the, the displacement of the matrix. And you use that as our actual uh, memory address. 
uh, strictly speaking, this should be MPI address because you might be on an old DOS machine with segmented memory, but in practice, this is just fine. So here, we'll show the actual code again. Again, uh, creating the, the role and block description of the data requires a, an actual chunk of memory and some of our uh, logical discussion, the way we think, the way the application thinks about the memory, it's gonna be this many rows by this many columns and we'll create a new MPI data type. And, and we can describe with these basic types, MPI int, you've seen a lot of this type creation stuff with uh, when Bill and Rusty and Rajiv talked, but uh, again, they're using MPI too. The idea of, uh, yeah, sorry, we're, getting, we're doing it, I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> you'll, see this, you'll see this in the MPI IO case as well, but right now we're just using, we're creating these data types for the sake of sending messages back and forth. <clears throat> and here again, uh, the actual source code for the index case. Uh, in the end, we have this, this constructed type, new type, which is a, an H index, the vector of ints. And that, all that means is we've just described every location in memory in a single call, <clears throat> and we can get rid of the uh, inner type, this vec type, and because reference counting inside will keep track of, of who's got what. Putting a, row, putting a row in this case is the way we handle a, a row here is very easy. We're just going to display it. We cannot restart the code here. There's no state being saved. We're just displaying to a screen, and then um, we're just displaying to a screen, and, and then moving on. So your restart, if you if you ignore the can restart call and try to restart anyway, you'll you'll get you'll get a big fat uh, error. And so that's the, the simple sending that all off to rank zero. We have sort of discussed the data structures we're worrying about. We're just, we've discussed the decomposition of the data. And from there, it's not too big a loop, too big a leap to parallelize it. So we'll talk about, uh, again, when we come up with the idea of a message passing interface having an IO component, that might seem a little funny at first, but if you think about sending a message to somebody is kind of like writing to a file. Receiving a message from somebody is sort of like reading from a file. And the same things that made MPI so powerful, data types and collectives, those have a role to play in, in file systems too. So uh, a lot of this looks like MPI, we're just doing it at the, at the file level. If you look at just a little bit past the, uh, if, you, if you apply MPI abstractions to the file system, then this all makes a little more, a little more sense. Recurring theme here, Collective I.O. lets us turn what looks like lots of tiny individual requests into something a little friendlier to the file system. Uh, we could maybe even do things like, you know, not only are we going to uh, reduce the number of requests, but, uh, or sorry, increase the number, the size of the average size of the request, but we might have certain nodes are, have a fast link off to uh, the storage devices and other funds have a slow one. In Phil's example, maybe you want only the nodes with burst buffers to be your IO aggregators so that they can get the data off to the aggregator and let something else spin it off to storage. This is an area that we're going to have a lot of fun experimenting with, uh, but right now it's still, uh, you know, we're still getting, we're still getting the, the hardware, so we can't really do much experiments yet. A collective MPI IO function looks a lot like a collective routine. Oh, sorry, does not look like a collective routine. And uh, they're a little bit different. They, they are explicit. They put a, um, an all at the end of it. So you know that as, as, as contrasting to MPI file write, the all version is the collective version. Uh, important things here are uh, that you get a, a buffer count and data type tuple, just like you do for MPI send and receive and other, other collectives, uh, sorry, and, and the other collectives. Uh, each process here is going to specify its, its own stuff, and then the library will take care of stitching up a global view. Uh, one thing that trips up people sometimes, a little thing, and it might save you a, a, a bit, is that we need everybody who opened the file to participate in a collective I.O. operation in these examples, everybody has data. Everybody has their own region of the, of the file they're going to write out. But you can imagine a particle data where particles have all clumped together in one section of the global array, and there's one corner where there's no data to write out. And that's not a problem either. Everyone can still call MPI file write out all this with zero particles to write out. And everyone participates, and it may turn out that the process with zero particles is actually the, the I.O. aggregator that's best suited to do the I.O., but anyway, that's, those are all details that the library will worry about. So let's go through the code and, and talk a bit about, about what's going on. We'll have a little extra data here. This is going to be pretty straightforward. Everyone, every process is going to describe its data, and then instead of sending it to rank zero to do the write, 
They're just going to send it off to the MPI uh, right at call, right at all call. You'll see a little extra data from rank zero. We'll, we'll describe the header here, right? There's going to we need to figure out what this blob of data is. Uh, MPI I/O is not uh, in any way self-describing, uh, even if you do some of the more portable data representation cases in, in MPI I/O. Uh, even if you do that, you still don't have this self-describing nature. So you have to have something saying, look, I've got this global uh, N by M matrix, and uh, this checkpoint is for the 60th iteration. And that can be done with a few small header in the back, or, or a footer, if you want to be a little more clever. Um, and again, notice here, no green bands here. We're only writing out the, uh, the, the important data. We're not going to save the cells that are only needed for the simulation. That fits well to to um, to write at all. There are uh, there are now non-blocking collectives, but I won't talk too much about I won't talk at all about those. That's a fairly new uh, feature. Uh, but if you if you want to explore that on your own, that's something you can check out for bonus points. Uh, to restart from these checkpoints, which we can do now. First, we have one process. For, in this case, rank zero. Uh, look at the header. Make sure everything's uh, kosher, and then. Uh, set up a, a collective read of all that data. So also, the, uh, see I'm already on slide on page three of nine, so you can skip over two pages here. To do a checkpoint, this is, uh, again, sorry, it's a little tougher to read. I should use a darker font, but I'll point out the highlights here. We're looking at the checkpoint. We have, a, again, just like with the serial, uh, the parallel I.O. case, no, sorry, the standard I.O. case, same to things, a, a file name and, and a description of the data and a tuning parameter but we're actually going to do some I.O. here. We'll construct a file name describing, uh, describing the, 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 the name. Well, the file itself will contain some information. That's kind of a, just so you can have a, a namespace, no namespace collisions. Uh, and we'll open the file with, a, with our, our, our communicator. Uh, MPI file open is collective. Let's just do some things uh, behind the scenes that we couldn't do otherwise. But, but also associates this communicator with all the other uh, collective file routines. We won't ever see this communicator again. The only time it's used is in MPI file open. Again, these utility functions tell us where we are uh, physically in the file with our logical notion of uh, rank, of row and column. Uh, rank zero does a small header, uh, appends a small header to the, the row and the blocks uh, that we that create. The other ranks just need to have the row and the blocks, and then we'll, uh, if we once we've done that, every, every process is, uh, so you see, uh, every process is creating a slightly different type, but they're all going to call MPI file right at all. But every process is described. In this case, we've decomposed evenly. Everyone has the same number of rows and columns, but again, wouldn't take too much adjusting to give uh, a variable number of rows and columns to each process. Just a little more bookkeeping. To restart, uh, we pass some tuning flags to A mode. Uh, now, in practice, everyone passes MPI mode read write, but if you want to be a, the really friendliest you can to the MPI library, if you put in read only, certain optimizations can happen in the library. Uh, the other highlight here is, you know, this looks a lot like writing. We, we tell ourselves where uh, we are. We map from the global local view to the actual, sorry, global logical view to the local physical view with a couple of utility functions. We construct a, a, a name for the file and open it up. And then we do a quick inspection of the header. There's a, again, the three bytes, three ints in the header. The, rows, the columns, and the iterations. And if that's all kosher, if we, uh, we do an all-reduce and everyone got the same, sorry, we do an all-reduce, and rank zero, who looked at, the, looked at this checkpoint file, if that matches up what all the processes that, that booted up uh, expect, you know, I expect to have a, a 200 by 400 file. Oh, yeah, we see that. Great. Uh, then we can, can, we can continue. And after you do that, we can construct the rows uh, we might we do a little adjustment here to, to account for the header, uh, and then we can read the file collectively. Uh, so to see, to point out here, uh, these rows and columns are going to be a little bit shifted in the file because we've, uh, we've, we've put this header on top. But then the library will take care of, of aligning things and, and being friendly for us. Now, the MPI data type for the header is a little more complicated, but not too complicated. Uh, well, well, instead, we're going to use a struct type. And the struct type is what you use when you uh, two cases. One, when you have different types of data. So if you have, 
uh, you have, for example, in, in, a astrophys in a cosmology code, you're going to write out particles that have a floating point value um, recording their location in, in X and Y and Z. But then you have an integer saying how many of those particles there are. That would be a good case for a struct type. The other case is if you need to adjust uh, bounds on this, on this type. So for example, we are, um, we're going to uh, struct here uh, is going to uh, store the, the indicate that, that we're talking about memory, actual memory address. So MPI bottom is a, is a weird type. But uh, in MPI 2 and newer, you'd probably use resized. But uh, struct is a good, reliable case. And lots of, lots, of old, lots of code still uses it. So backing up one slide. You've seen, this, you've seen me refer to this function a few times already. Create header row block. Now we'll talk about the actual implementation. We've, we've given it a, a chunk of memory. And if you look on Stack Overflow, a lot of questions about on Stack Overflow and MPI questions is, you know, the common way to allocate a two-dimensional array might be to go through and here's, an, here's my, uh, my rows. And for every row, I'm going to allocate a column of data. And if that's how you do your 2Ds arrays, you're going to have a hard time in MPI. Not impossible. But you have to do a lot more relative memory addresses. Uh, the simplest thing in, in both message passing and, and the I.O. side of MPI is just allocate your 2D array as a big, contigu a big contiguous chunk of memory and then let your array indexes do the addressing. So we pass in you know, the rows and columns, and we'll create a new type. The arguments to structure are a little bit verbose. You have uh, an array of lengths and displacements and types. And then you'll create a new type out of that, all that. So we'll stick, we'll stick it all together. We have uh, the address of, of the row array, and the address of the column array, and the iteration. And we take these, uh, these, four, these four displacements and, and stick it all together into a, a struct type. And now, after you've done that, you, you've, you've wrapped it all up, you've put it away. Now you can ignore um, the realities of, of your memory, uh, the details of your, of your memory allocation anymore. You, this all tidied up in a nice little function. So I'll talk a little bit some, uh, in, in the next section, I'll talk about some, some libraries to help hide these details. Uh, but looking at the, the, the inner workings of MPI-IO can help you understand what's going on in, in the higher libraries. Or maybe a library isn't quite what you need, so you have to do these sort of manual type constructions and, 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 and thinking of, of IO structures on your own. You, you might, I, I would probably encourage, I would, I would almost always encourage application writers to not be doing MPI-IO directly. Uh, the, the, the interface is uh, pretty verbose. There's not a lot of hand-holding that's available. And there's a lot of, as you can see, very low-level details you need to worry about. However, it's a great foundation for Parallel.net CDF and HDF5 and other I.O. libraries. And when you uh, use those libraries, this is the kind of thing that's going on under the hood. Uh, we didn't talk about a lot of aspects of MPI I.O. We just talked about how you might tie into a very simple uh, game of life interface, but um, you might have a, 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 a application where collective isn't a good fit, either because your data is already very large and naturally aligned to the file system for some reason, or uh, for example, there's this code called Chombo where you are descending a, a adaptive mesh code. And as you walk the tree, you write out leaf data to the file. Well, a, a parallel tree walk is not going to lend itself well to this sort of collective, everyone's at the same point, write it out. Uh, there's some ways around that with, um, with some different interfaces. But uh, you may find that um, your application isn't the perfect fit for some of these collective applications. And then we can work with that. We can, we can come up with approaches to uh, describe or batch or reorder the operations in some way that makes more sense. 